A trampoline, swings and a slide, all sad reminders of the twins who spent hours enjoying playing outside their house at Deer Park in Charleville. Thomas and Patrick O'Driscoll, described as lovable rogues, had just finished up in school when their older brother Jonathan collected them and brought them home in the afternoon. But for some bizarre and unknown reason, murdered them shortly afterwards. This case comes to us today from a town named Charville in County Cork, in the southwest of Ireland, where it is home to Golden Vale, which is part of the Kerry Group, which is the largest employer in the town. Golden Vale gets its name from the actual area, which was originally called Golden Vane, as it has the best pasture land for dairy farming in Ireland. Charville cheese you may be familiar with dates back to 1912 and were the creators of the world's first sliced cheddar. Here in this town, in an area called Deer Park, was a settled traveller family named the O'Driscolls, Helen and her husband Thomas and their five children. Like my other videos in this playlist, it's a tough one for sure, and I would ask you all to be kind in the comments. And please skip the video altogether if you might find it triggering or too upsetting. The eldest of the five children, Jonathan, was adopted by Helen and Thomas. They had tried for many years to conceive and even lost a baby before they finally decided to adopt. If you know anything about the travelling community, family is everything. The bigger the better and they are a fierce close community. They'd fight you for the shirt off your back, but they'd also give it to you. Helen would say that Jonathan was a quiet baby and a real home bird as he grew up. He'd be in the house with her rather than be on the streets. He never got into trouble, loved his computer games, football, hurling and the ponies. He even loved boxing. All interests that managed to keep him out of trouble. He was known as the gentle giant within the community. Years later, Helen and Thomas would be blessed with twin boys, Tommy and Paddy. There would be an 11 year age gap between them and Jonathan. Paddy was like a March hare growing up. He was wild and saw no danger. Helen said you could go out the back door and he'd be running along the top of the shed. Tommy was completely different. He was more cautious and saw danger in everything. So he kept close to his mammy. He'd help her in the kitchen, chat away and was great for cleaning up and doing the wash up. Two completely different personalities and looks, but still twins. Jonathan took to being a big brother great. He loved them to bits. He'd bring them places, play with them and look out for them as any big brother would. He'd never hit them or shout at them. He was always kind. The twins in turn looked up to their big brother. Once Helen had the twins, she eventually would have two more boys. She finally had her big family and she couldn't be happier. Just a side note, there is a mention of a daughter in two articles I read, but no information was given, so I am unsure of the situation. But I didn't want to leave her out. She seems to be an older girl, as she did give statements to the press at the time of the funeral. Around a year and a half before that fateful day, Jonathan was in the kitchen with his mother, and he lashed out at her and pushed her against the wall and said to her, Are you trying to poison me? Poor Helen got an awful fright as she had never seen him like this before. She said when she looked into his eyes that day, it wasn't her son that was looking back at her. She knew straight away something wasn't right. Eventually Helen was so afraid of Jonathan that she had to take out a protective order against him and he had to leave the house. She also asked a judge for help to have Jonathan assessed and this was granted. Helen at this time also was notified by the social workers that Jonathan contacted the adoption agency in order to find his biological parents and Helen asked them to give him any information they had just so Jonathan would put it behind him as he had threatened to do harm to himself if he didn't get the information. While Jonathan was getting treatment and seemed to be doing well Helen let him back into the house but she had no idea how sick he was until the inquest. The health service never informed the family that he was diagnosed with early onset schizophrenia, bipolar and had depression. He was on a mountain of tablets and he wasn't taking them regular. 
In fact, it would come out that he had stopped taking them a week and a half before what he ended up doing. Helen said if she had known how sick he was, she would never have let him back into the house, let alone ask him to mind the children. That fateful day. This is what poor Helen has to live with ever since. On the 4th of September 2014, Helen and her husband Thomas went to Waterford to buy a roll-top gypsy style wagon for the twins as a present. I have to say it is an amazing piece of work and I can only imagine the excitement of the two boys and the younger ones. So Helen asked Jonathan would he pick up the four children from school and creche and look after them until they got back. To Jonathan this was no problem as he was now 21 driving and a responsible chap. On the way back from Waterford Helen received a phone call from Jonathan asking how long they would be. Helen replied, we are around an hour away from home, on our way back. She said he didn't sound any way off in his tone. He said, Paddy wants to talk to you, and he handed over the phone to him. Paddy was all excited and asked, Mammy, did you get our wagon? She said, I did. Paddy replied, I love you, Mammy, and Helen replied, I love you too, son. Be good for Jonathan. And this would be the last time she would ever speak to them all. 15 minutes after this phone call, something snapped inside of Jonathan and he would stab to death both twins in separate bedrooms while they still were in their school uniforms. Jonathan fled from the house and the two younger children, aged three and five, who were unharmed, ran to the hedge of the house next door and raised the alarm. Immediately the neighbours rang the Gardaí and a terrible scene was uncovered. A major emergency operation was put in place and an hour later and 15 kilometres away, Jonathan was found by three children hanging from a tree, dead. Finally Helen turned the corner to her house and all she saw was Gardaí, family members and yellow tape surrounding her house but she had no idea the extent of what she was about to face. A total nightmare. Three of her children dead and no answers why. Her whole family nearly gone, all because of a mental problem that they weren't made fully aware of. Helen said afterwards it was a sickness worse than cancer that just came out and swallowed Jonathan up. It wasn't Jonathan that day. The boys could have been anything to him. It wasn't the boys he saw, but monsters that had manifested in his head. Paddy and Tommy were pronounced dead at the scene and later brought to the hospital for post-mortem examinations. The twins died from more than 40 stab wounds each and two knives were found at the body of Jonathan, which were later determined as the weapons used in the attack. Jonathan had bought one of the knives at a co-op and had researched stabbing methods and suicide on the internet. The funeral of all three took place a few days later and it was heartbreaking. Family, friends and the extended community all turned out to give the children a final farewell, including their beloved pony with the wagon they never got to see, leading the procession to their final resting place. Just hours before Thomas and Paddy died last Thursday, their parents had bought them a miniature wagon which they never got to see. Today their pony pulled the wagon ahead of the two white coffins. The twins were buried together at Holy Cross Cemetery in Charlesville, County Cork and Jonathan was buried at Kilmallock Cemetery in County Limerick beside his mother Helen's parents. It was said at the funeral that the twins were lovable rogues, fun-loving and energetic. They loved playing with their friends, were very honest, direct and straight to the point. They knew how to say sorry and were famous for their hugs. Paddy found it hard to mind things. His hearing aid was dismantled and put together many a time. Tommy was proud that he got a Horrid Henry book as a prize in after school. They both took care of each other and stood up for each other all the time. Jonathan was not left out of the eulogy. The day he came to live with the Driscolls was one of the happiest days of their lives up until then. He made the whole family happy. He was there when you needed him and could pop up at any stage. He loved all his godchildren and never forgot a birthday. Even though they were not all buried together, the O'Driscoll family had the funeral mass with the three of them together and paid equal respect to all three. 
They know Jonathan was sick and not well enough to medicate himself and keep an eye on what he had taken or not taken. Helen feels if she had been aware how sick he was and how much meds he was on, she could have asked him, did you take your meds and so on, and kept a better eye on him. Here we are again, patient confidentiality, put before the well-being of the people around the patient, which again leads to a life and death situation and the people the closest and most in danger left completely out of the loop. These were totally unnecessary deaths that could have been prevented with just a little bit of knowledge and trust. Helen and her family never lived in the house again and returned to the government housing body. Her husband Thomas stayed living in a mobile home at the back of the house until 2019 when they were given a new home to start their life again. This all came about at Christmas. Even though Helen got the keys to the new house on the 17th of December, she waited until Christmas Day to surprise the two younger children and all their presents and tree were waiting for them at the new house. They were beyond excited. Unfortunately, Thomas had surgery that same Christmas and had to have his foot amputated, followed by more surgery to remove more of his leg due to diabetic complications but they are all living under the same roof again, at least. The original house is to be knocked and a new one to be built on the same site, but it is still standing to this day. Helen's biggest fear now is that they won't knock it and another family will move in there. But as custom to the traveling community and maybe others, their belief is that their children's spirits still roam the rooms of the house they died in. And in order to set them free, the house should be knocked. I won't be commenting on this as it's everyone to their own and if that's what their belief is then that's what it is. I do hope though that they have some peace now and are happy and thriving. Helen still advocates for mental health issues every chance she gets and it keeps her busy and involved in the hope that it will save lives. I personally wish her nothing but happiness and strength because she suffered every mother or father's worst nightmare, losing three children and all at once at the hands of one of their children.